Perfect. Then, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Marcus Mueller's KISS seminar. Thank you for joining. Um, just as a reminder of the format, we will have a shortish presentation, 30 to 40 minutes. Some, often we go over time. Um, and this is being recorded uh, on, on YouTube. Um, so if you, have a, if you have a question that is to the point or clarifying questions, you, you can just unmute yourself and ask it. Otherwise, if it's a more substantive question, please hold it for after the, the end of the presentation because we, as usual, we have very ample time for discussion. And so without further ado, I pass the microphone to Marcus. Okay, can you hear me still? Okay, right. So first of all, uh, thanks for having me, Andrea, and all the other organizers. Um, thank you, everybody, for zooming in. Um, so this is, okay, let me start sharing my screen first. Um, desktop to um, play. Okay, can you see the first slide? Excellent. Yes. Right. So, Today, I'm talking about uh, research that tries to understand how space-time uh, constrains the structure of quantum theory. Um, I will talk about two topics, basically, an old one, which is already from 2014, and a new one, which is a couple of months old. And several people were involved in this. So there's um, my group currently at ECOKI Vienna, which is this picture on the, on the left slide, uh, on the left side here. So there's Carolyn Jones, uh, Stefan Ludescher, Albert Arloy, and in the middle, there's Thomas Galley. So Thomas is also involved in some follow-up work that we're doing on this now. Uh, for the, the older work, there's Andy Garner uh, involved and also Oscar Dalston. And let me begin with a little overview. So first part, I will give you the motivation for why would you perhaps care about such a strategy or doing something like that. Um, the second part, I will give you a little thought experiment that shows you how Relativity of simultaneity basically constrains the structure of the qubit. Uh, the third part, so the, as I said, the second part is a bit older. That's already from 2014. So if some of you have already seen that, I apologize. But the third part is, is newer. That's um, about randomness generation via rotational symmetry. And this is just appeared in the archive in, what was it, November, I think. Yes. And then I will conclude. And perhaps we can discuss a bit about what we might perhaps learn from this. Now, what's the motivation here? Um, motivation, at least for me, comes from quantum gravity. Uh, I should say, I'm, with this, I'm not really directly contributing to quantum gravity. Still, I see it as a kind of motivation. Um, and let me show you why this is a motivation with some kind of analogy. Suppose you're not interested in quantum gravity, you want to do something else. Maybe what you want is you want a complete theory of evolution. So you want to understand how did life evolve on Earth? How did this come about, when and why, and so on? And you know that it has to do, for example, with an interplay of the environment with perhaps the biological traits that you have as an animal, as a plant, and maybe changes of the environment change also the biological traits and so on. Uh, you want to understand that it come up with a, with a complete theory of that. But suppose that there's really sparse empirical evidence. So suppose that things are much worse than they are for us. So maybe you live on a planet, which is a desert planet, and you've only ever seen the desert and no other environments. So in this desert, there are a couple of animals and plants like these cactuses and these camels. Uh, this is something you see, but also you don't find any fossils. So then what can you say? Now, what can you do in this situation? And certainly, uh, one option is you, well, you just take what you know, stuff you know about animals, plants, and geology, and try to develop a full-blown theory direct directly. But there's a second option, something that you might perhaps want to try first. We say, well, let's first see how the environment constrains the biological traits that we have. So, for example, you might say, well, maybe it's not a miracle that camels have two humps. Maybe this has something to do with the heat and with the fact that having these humps helps them to be protected from the sunlight and to save some fat for long uh, trips without any food and so on. And this certainly involves at least a small amount of imagination. You need to, to think about counterfactually perhaps about how could biology be different. You could, should think of 
camels without humps, perhaps, or cactuses that don't have these um, spikes, right? Maybe you want to think of completely different imagined environments and then imagined animals like this green thing here that would live in a very wet environment. And once you know that, that certainly will inform your attempts to come up with a theory of evolution. Um, when you have some, uh, some explanation for perhaps why, in some sense, why uh, the animals and plants you see around you have the form that they have. Okay, now what about quantum gravity? Well, if you want a complete theory of quantum gravity, I think it's fair to say that there's also sparse empirical evidence about what exactly that should look like in the end. Um, and again, and this is something fascinating that a lot of my friends are doing, is what you can try to do. You try to develop a full-blown theory directly. Right? Now, something else you can do if you're a bit more modest um, then or maybe you know you don't know all the techniques that you would actually need to do that. Something you can do first, I think, and this is what we want to do here, is to study how space-time constrains quantum theory. For example, you can say, well, look, there's the qubit, the quantum bit. Uh, this looks like this block ball here, which is a three-dimensional ball. North pole is a zero state, south pole the one state, and then it fits so nicely. Uh, into a space because uh, it can be the internal degrees of freedom of a spin one half particle. Um, if the qubit were differently, then this wouldn't work so well. So in some sense, when you want to do that, then you need some kind of imagination, maybe some mathematically rigorous imagination for how quantum theory could be different. Well, if it's different, it wouldn't be quantum theory anymore. So you'd say like how the theory that describes probabilities and correlations of detector clicks in our universe, how that could be different. And this is certainly a topic that has been studied a lot in recent years. So it, one way in which this could be different, for example, is that you could have something like super strong non-locality. So you can think of non-local boxes, something like popesco rohrlich boxes, that give you violations of Bell inequalities that exceed those that are possible within quantum theory. Or perhaps you could think of a proposal by Raphael Sorkin um, of higher order interference, where you say, what if I have a triple slit experiment? Could it be that in contrast to what quantum theory predicts that maybe the pattern that I see cannot be explained just by contributions from pairs of paths? Um, <clears throat> so perhaps, so, so the idea is that some of these exotic phenomena can perhaps directly be ruled out just on the basis of the fact that they have to fit into space and time somehow. I see this as a, as a kind of fascinating possibility and it's just nice in itself to study whether that's true or not, I think. Um, second motivation, uh, perhaps a bit more hands-on, comes from what's called semi-device independent quantum information. So suppose, so for those of you who don't know that, so if you know that already, you can sleep now for five minutes. Uh, but for those who haven't seen that, and just suppose you want to generate some certified random bits, bits that are unpredictable and you also don't want anybody else to predict them. Uh, now you can see, well, certainly I have quantum theory, so why not just send single photons on a half silvered mirror? Right? So I send a photon, it's either reflected or transmitted. Um, so it's 50-50 unpredictable, so I get random bits. Is that good? Well, it's maybe good, but not maybe not good enough. So you know, um, it might just be the case that the mirror doesn't really do what you think it does. So perhaps you even bought the mirror from the NSA, right? And in fact, um, the apparent unpredictability that you have here determines on some random variable lambda that's actually known by an eavesdropper so that there's an eavesdropper somewhere else that can predict your outcomes just by knowing more about the mirror than you do. Um, and so this motivates a kind of a higher standard of security where you say, I want something like device independent randomness expansion. Um, the main idea here is that when you have a violation of a Bell inequality, then this often tells you that the outcomes that you see, um, they are non-log like super strongly correlated between two parties and then they cannot be correlated with anything else in the world. There would be a lot more to say about this. I don't want to go much more into that, but if you haven't seen that, there's a great talk by Antonio Athene on this. There's also a very nice book by Valerius Scarani that you that you find on the slide here. What I want to talk about, however, is, is what's called not device independent, but semi-device independent um, protocols. 
And the motivation here is that maybe you don't want to build a full-blown Bell experiment in your laboratory because that's very difficult. So perhaps there's a simpler setup where you actually allow communication between the devices, but then you also have to add an assumption to make that work. So here's a typical scheme that people talk about. You have two boxes, a preparation box that prepares a state, say S, a measurement box M. You don't make any assumption about these, what these boxes are doing. You're just saying, well, you have a choice of input. So the preparation box has an input, maybe one, two, three, or four. The measurement box has also an input, one or two. So perhaps that's something like the choice of measurement that you actually want to make. And then you get an outcome A. Um, now, the point is that in some of these scenarios, um, just from the observed correlations, you can infer that you have certified random numbers. So for example, just from the setup, you can estimate the conditional probability of the outcome A given the settings X and Y. And this may look random. So perhaps these probabilities are close to one half, which is good. You want randomness, but you want to say more. You also want that, for example, the conditional entropy of your outcome A, given X, Y, and also given lambda, all other relevant variables that are relevant for this experiment, that entropy should also be larger than zero. So it means that even if you have this demon here, this, this red horned guy that knows so much more about your setup than you and all the positions of the air molecules and whatnot, um, you should still not be able to predict the outcome A. And you can do these in, this kinds of, in these kinds of scenarios, but you have to add an assumption here. So and the typical assumption that people add is about the system that's transmitted from the preparation to the measurement device. Typically, people, for example, assume that this is a qubit uh, or that you have a bound on the dimension of the quantum system that's transmitted from the preparation to the measurement. Uh, a certain drawback to that, I would say this assumption is not typically physically very well motivated. Usually you have a photon or something and that's embedded in an infinite dimensional Fox space. And so perhaps this is not so well motivated. It also requires you to assume quantum theory to begin with, something you may also not want to do perhaps. There's also an observation here, namely the settings are typically not just abstract inputs that you give like zeros and ones as you want to think as a computer scientist, but often they are something like the direction of a polarizer or the direction of a magnetic field. So they often have some spatiotemporal uh, character. Now what this motivates is to somehow think of reformulating these um, protocols in, in space-time terms, in terms of space-time symmetries, and doing this perhaps in a way where you don't even need to assume quantum theory. And the question then is, doing this, can you then reproduce the quantum predictions for example, the functionality of this device, the correlations that you get, or the security of the scheme. So this is one, one other motivation to look at this constraints of space-time on probabilities and on quantum field. All right, so let me begin with a thought experiment um, that we had with Andy Garner and Oscar Dahlsten already in 2014. Um, and the idea is to think about the constraints of, of, of um, relativity of simultaneity on a qubit. What you have to do is you have to imagine how could the quantum bit, bit be different. So here's a quantum bit, a qubit state space. It's basically a three ball. Um, you know, the pure states are somewhere on the boundary, mixed state is in the center. But as we know already from the work of Jordan, von Neumann and Wigner, there are very well motivated modifications of this. So you can think of bits or quantum bits that correspond not to a Hilbert space, but to a, for Neum, so to a Jordan algebra, for example. And in this case, your, your bit could still look like a ball, but of another dimension. So it's a th the, the three-dimensional bit, our ordinary qubit, is the one for quantum theory over the complex numbers. If you think, for example, about only allowing real numbered amplitudes, then this would get rid of one parameter and you would get a two-dimensional ball, something like a disk state space. If you go further down and just say, I only allow the two possibilities and the statistical mixtures, this corresponds to a, to a classical bit, which is a one-dimensional ball, but the dimension could also be higher. And these would also be state spaces discussed here in the Jordan algebra context, for example. A five-dimensional ball, by the way, would correspond to a qubit 
for quantum theory where the amplitudes are, um, are quaternions. This H is for quaternions here. Okay. Now, when you haven't seen this at all before, you might wonder, well, wait a second, aren't, what about higher level quantum systems like a trit and Q trits? Isn't this also a ball in complex space somehow? But um, what's a ball there is really just the, the complex state vectors. Whereas the states we're talking about here are the corresponding projections or density matrices. And they are only a ball if it's a qubit and they look much more complicated if it's say a trit. And then you get a convex set of quantum states of density matrices that has like flat pieces and looks very complicated. So a ball is a bit, and then you may ask, well, um, why is it three-dimensional? Now, there are certainly other works that try to answer this question. So we have Alexei here in the audience who knows about reconstructions of quantum theory from informational principles and so on. Hi. Um, but here we really want to see whether we can get a space-time reason somehow for why dimension is three. And here's a simple thought experiment that can give this to some extent. So think about something like a Machzehnder interferometer. So you have a particle, something like a particle, whatever that is, that can be either in the upper or in the lower branch of this interferometer. And so it's something like a bit, uh, two possibilities. And then you can think of a d-dimensional block ball describing the state of the particle. It would mean that if the particle is definitely in the upper branch, then you would have the state that corresponds to the north pole of the block ball. If it's definitely in the lower branch, it would correspond to the south pole. Now, what about a state on the equator, for example? Well, that would be something that's some kind of superposition between the two. And whatever it means, it would mean in particular that when you measure where it is, you would get 50-50 probability for finding it in the upper or in the lower branch. So in general, um, the probability to finding the particle in the upper branch would then have to be related to the Z coordinate of your Bloch ball. So probabilities are always linear here, so it would be something like one half times Z plus one. Okay. Now suppose you have a physicist, Alice, or so sitting close to one of the branches, and she can decide to do something to the to the arm. Perhaps she would like to put a little face plate inside the arm or so. And you can ask, what could this be? So what transformations T could you do locally in one arm? And let's look only at those that are reversible, where you don't lose, lose any information. So whatever that is, in the block ball picture, it would have to be described by some rotation of this block ball. Uh, like unitaries do for a qubit, um, it would have to preserve the state space and you could also reverse it. Also, it shouldn't change the probability of finding a particle up or down, but this means that it must preserve the Z component. So it must preserve the Z axis of your Bloch ball. Right? You can think of doing the same thing on B. So another physicist, Bob, is now close to the lower branch. And if that's really all the constraints that you have, then you would say, well, then on A and on B, what you can do as transformations is just all the rotations that fix the z-axis. So it's basically the rotation group of dimension D minus one, uh, one dimension less than the block ball. Good. Now here comes relativity of simultaneity. So um, relativity tells you that there is one frame of reference, uh, fly by in a spaceship, where it seems to you that actually when you do this here in parallel, TA and TB, the TA happens first and then TB. But for another frame of reference, it would be the other way around, TB first and then TA. But both frames of reference, um, both descriptions would agree on the probabilities of all measurements that you might want to do in the end. But this can only work if the transformations commute, right? So if TA, TB is the same as TB, TA. Now this must work for all the rotations S or D minus one. Now you can already see where this is going. So we all know that the rotations only commute in one or two dimensions, but not in three dimensions or higher. So this constrains the block ball to have dimension at most three. And three is actually the one that we see in our world for the qubit. Yeah. So, so far we made a kind of simplifying assumption. We said that Alice and Bob, what they can do is exactly identical as a group. And that's a hidden assumption of relationality in the following sense. It assumes in particular that whatever you can do in one arm, say by some TA, you can undo in the other arm by TA minus one. I think of a face plate in one arm and putting the same face plate in the other arm. But you can weaken this assumption and say, let's, let's relax this and just say whatever Alice and Bob can do 
is isomorphic to each other. So it's a symmetric situation what, for every operation of Alice, there's an analogous one for Bob. And then it turns out that you get another solution, which is a five-dimensional ball. And this is exactly quaternionic quantum mechanics. So you can um, classify the possibilities in terms of a theorem. You can say, let's make some assumption about how the probabilities interplay with the equipment here. So first assumption would be to say, I want a beam splitter, whatever that is, that can prepare any upper branch probability P between zero and one. Let me go to the last one first, A3 will tell you that the groups of operations for Alice and Bob are isomorphic. So they are kind of exchangeable. So there's a symmetry between Alice and Bob between what they can do. Um, now, I need one more thing. So what we need to exclude is, for example, the following. It could be that it's actually a 10-dimensional ball, but only three of the dimensions ever are relevant for the experiment. The others are just sitting there untouched. Right? This is something we can never exclude. So we need another assumption. We say we're actually looking at the effective state space, and that's A2. A2 says that every pure state with the same probability to be up can be prepared somehow by reversible operations locally in the arms. And when you do that, and then you also demand relativity of simultaneity, then you get exactly these possibilities. The dimension of the ball is one, which would be the classical bit, or quantum bit over the real numbers, or the complex numbers, or the quaternions. Well, the quaternions is interesting because Somehow you would have local transformations that are the, the left and what's called the right isoclinic rotations of SO4. These are like SU2 subgroups of SO4 that commute with each other and tell you what you do in these arms. It's kind of a special solution. Um, the fun thing is somehow that relativity of simultaneity really singles out those state spaces that correspond to associative division algebras. And it really kills most of the higher dimensional possibilities. All right, um, <clears throat> now let's go to a bit of uh, newer work that has to do with semi-device independent stuff and randomness generation. So, so this is a scheme that I've shown you that people are often looking at. Yeah. Two untrusted devices, untrusted preparation measurement device, and a semi-device independent assumption that's made on the systems that are sent back and forth, in this case, only in one direction. Namely, for example, that these are qubits, that they are two-dimensional. Right. We replace it now by something simpler um, that has to do with space and time in some sense. Space, actually, only in this sense, very simple one. So we have a preparation box that has an input x, which can be one or two. And then a system is sent to the measurement box. And then you have a measurement, and you get outcome b, which is plus or minus 1. So then the statistics is then characterized by a conditional probability of, of B given X. Um, now here's uh, how to think of that. So, so if the input to the preparation box is, is one, then you just do nothing to the preparation device. You just let it do its preparation. Whereas if the input is two, what you do is you, you rotate the whole preparation procedure by some angle alpha relative to the measurement device, right? in a fixed plane. Uh, you should think of alpha as just being fixed. Alpha might be 30 degrees or so. It's just the same in every run. Okay. Um, now, as I said before, we need to make some assumption about the physical system for that to be useful. Before it, it was dimension bound. Now, our semi device independent assumption here is about the quote unquote spin of the system that's traveling from preparation to measurement. And we upper bound the spin. We say that the spin should be less than or equal to j. And j is some integer or half integer. Yeah. Um, we make no further assumptions on the devices or on, on the systems. So what does spin mean here? Well, you could really think of, you know, you, you believe that you, that you send a photon and then the spin would be one for photon polarization. It could also have some orbital angular momentum. And then you would have to have some kind of belief from your setup of what, what this could maximally be. So spin here is really defined in a representation theoretic way. It's just the thing that tells you how your system responds to trend to rotations. So we know in quantum theory that symmetry transformations, in particular spatial rotations, um, correspond to projective representations of, of that group acting on the Hilbert space that's involved in the setup. Yeah. 
And the assumption of spin less than or equal to J just tells you that, well, the representation of SO2 rotation that we hear, the labels are between minus J and plus J. Yeah. So some represent it's a bit maybe you're more familiar with, with SU2 or SO3 representation theory that's also very similar. The spin can be integer, half integer here as well. Um, but the group is commutative, so it's like one-dimensional irreps. So this is like a block diagonal. This is a diagonal matrix which with complex exponentials that represents your representation. And now you don't know what these devices are doing, but whatever they're doing, it must be described by a formula like that. So you have some state row that's prepared, the unitary acts on it. Uh, in the end, you have some measurement operator of a positive operator where you measure and then the trace rule that gives you the probabilities. All right. Good. <clears throat> now, instead of the probabilities, let's now look at these correlations. So EX, so E1 and E2, um, this is basically the difference of the two outcome probabilities, probability plus one minus probability of minus one. So in this case, you have E1 and E2, and they can take on values between minus one and plus one. And they characterize the correlations that you can see in your setup. Here are some, actually some of these correlations are deterministic and here's some boring deterministic ones. So if like this corner here, plus one, plus one, what would this be? Well, this would be a scenario where your outcome B is just independent of your input X. So basically, in every run of the experiment, you just get plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one, no matter what you do as a rotation. Or the other green one would be always minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, no matter what you do. There are some a bit more interesting deterministic correlations, the other corners, where the outcome is a function of the input. So, you know, when you input one, you get definitely plus one. When you input two, you get definitely minus one and, and the other way around. Yeah. Now, maybe you go to the lab, you build it, and you see some correlation that's not deterministic and that looks random. Yeah. So far, so good. You want randomness. So, yes, you're happy for now. Um, but you're not, not really that happy to begin with. Because any correlation of that kind, if you don't have any other assumptions, can always be um, understood as a statistical mixture of deterministic correlations. So in this case, if you have the blue correlation in your data, it's like a one-third, one-third, one-third statistical mixture over deterministic correlations. And you can think of a hidden variable lambda that tells you which one is actually the case. It's just that you don't know the lambda, that's why you see the mixture. But then the eavesdropper might know lambda. And so the eavesdropper might predict the outcome. So then the hope is that now, when we actually put an extra assumption, the semi-device independent assumption, this rules out some of the correlations. And this then implies that you cannot have this decomposition anymore. So then we have to ask, if you make this assumption on the spin, what correlations are actually possible? Which ones are possible? And this is what, we, what we've proven here. You can write down a closed form expression for that. Um, so this is in our paper, but it uses also results by Van Himbeek, Peronio, and others. Um, so E1 and E2, these two numbers satisfy this inequality here with a bunch of square roots. Um, now let's see what that means. So suppose your angle that you've chosen is very large. So it's larger than pi over 2j. Then it turns out that all correlations are possible. So you have no constraints remaining. And then the, the problem that I mentioned before just hits you and you cannot certify any randomness. Yeah, this is a situation where basically the, the carrier can contain perfect information on your preparation if you want. But in all other cases, this is interesting. So if it's not the case, then you get a set of correlations that's like, like, like the blue bulked, bulky one. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of blue ones for different alphas, so please don't get confused by that. Um, but you can see, for example, that these interesting deterministic correlations, they become impossible. And this tells you if you now observe a correlation from the set um, and you're away from this red line in the middle, then you can actually certify private randomness from this. And you can be sure that the eavesdropper, even knowing more than you, does cannot predict the outcomes. And you can also try to work out how many bits these are. You can extract from randomness exactly if you want. Okay, now so far so good. Um, what we have now, I think, achieved at this point is we have, you know, semi-device independent randomness generation. We have replaced the unphysical dimension bound by something perhaps more physically motivated. But let's now go one step further. Let's drop quantum theory. 
Okay. The claim is that quantum theory is really not needed to understand this result. Now, when I make this claim, then this consists of a couple of, of, of intermediate claims. So first of all, we have to say, what does spin less than or equal to J mean if we don't have quantum theory? So the first question is, can we even formulate our semi device independent assumption without using quantum terminology? Um, and then when we do this, can we actually use the protocol to certify random numbers without assuming quantum theory? And can we understand yeah, this, this curved boundary of correlations here, perhaps also without assuming quantum theory just by the spatial symmetry of the setup? Well, and the fun answer is yes, we can. <laughs> And so let's in the remaining slides look at how this can be done and how we can get rid of quantum theory here. Um, so the idea is that um, you know you have this idea of quantum theory versus non-local boxes, which tells you there's something more general than quantum theories are these non-local boxes. Now we have something more general, which are these rotation boxes. Yeah. Um, we begin with what we call quantum spin J boxes. That's basically what was on a slide before. So a quantum spin J box tells you probability of some outcome plus one given alpha. So you say, what's the probability of a detector click and how does it depend on your angle alpha? And your constraint is that this should come from quantum theory's trace rule. We have some state rho, some measurement operator EB, and you have a unitary representation of the rotation group. Uh, you don't even say anything about the Hilbert space dimension. It can be anything, but you want, again, as before, that the spin is between minus J and plus J, basically, the, the representation label of SO2. Um, so you can ask, what, what are the possibilities here? That's just a, a bunch of possible probability rules. How your click depends on alpha, click probability. Now, a consequence of that, you can think of multiplying that out. Yeah, if it's complex exponentials, you write it as sines and cosines and collect the terms and everything becomes real. You have a real probability. So as a consequence, every probability law here is just a trigonometric polynomial of degree 2j. So if you spin one half particle, for example, then you could have something like this, one half plus one half cosine alpha, which is a degree one polynomial, and same for, for higher j. But then you can say, well, look, now I can just forget that I had quantum theory. I can just change in general define something like spin J rotation boxes. So these are just all the probability laws for click given rotation by alpha that are trigonometric polynomials of degree 2J. The probabilities should be between zero and one, but that's all I assume. Okay. Now, when you put them side by side, then you will first see that the quantum boxes are a subset of the rotation boxes. And um, for spin zero and spin one half, they are actually the same. This is something you can you can see directly. Um, for larger J, this, there seems to be a gap. So we can show that they're actually not the same for some larger J. Um, there's a funny structure appearing here. I don't want to say so much more because we're writing that up at the moment. So. <laughs> Um, should hopefully be a paper on that coming up soon. All right. Um, let me ask, okay, but isn't that a bit ad hoc? I just claim it should be a trigonometric polynomial. Shouldn't I think of this as some kind of representation theory? Somehow my, my rotations of space and time act on some state space. And it turns out, yes, you can also understand it in that way. So these rotation, so your quantum boxes come from representations of the rotation on the space of density matrices. And similarly, rotation boxes would come a representation of the rotations on some other state space, um, namely ones that mathematicians call orbitopes. So some other kinds of exotic state spaces that would give you these probabilities. Uh, but it would still preserve this kind of representation theoretic nature of how you would think of space-time translations, transformations acting on your probabilities. Good. Um, here in our setup, as I said, we're only interested in two angles. We either rotate not at all by zero or we rotate by some fixed angle alpha. We've already seen what the quantum correlations look like here, like this, this blue curved set with the inequality that I've shown you. Yeah, so again, this is really for the case and considering now where the angle is either zero or a fixed angle alpha. Now you can ask, well, what if I now go beyond quantum theory and allow these rotation boxes and look at the correlations that I can get if I'm only ever interested in two angles. 
And as before, it's clear that the quantum um, correlations are a subset of these rotation box correlations. Um, but what we've shown in our paper now is perhaps a bit surprisingly that they are actually exactly identical. So uh, the set of quantum correlations for two settings, two angles is exactly the same that you could get from general rotation box inputs. So in some sense, this tells you that you can derive the set of quantum correlations here without assuming quantum theory. You, you don't need to use quantum theory. It is in fact used heavily when you use the standard derivation. You talk about pure states and going into two dimensional subspaces for a qubit and, um, you know, um, but you can forget all this terminology and get it directly um, from this rotation box language. Uh, now this has also a funny consequence, an operational, uh, functional, let say, consequence, namely, this here, so even eavesdroppers with classical side information about beyond quantum physics uh, cannot predict your outcomes. So you're secure even against these kind of science fiction Sherlock Holmes people that know better physics than you. Um, you know, they know you, you see in your lab some quantum correlation. Um, this Sherlock Holmes knows it's not really quantum. You just see a mixture over post quantum correlations. Um, and he may actually know which mixtures these are, um, but this guy can still not use that knowledge to break your scheme and to, to predict the random numbers that you're, um, that you're generating. Right. Okay. So this is basically it. Let me, let me conclude. Um, so this is, I think, a, a modest, but fun, I think, approach. Um, I think of it as complementing direct quantum gravity approaches. Well, I'm absolutely not doing quantum gravity, but it's just for me a motivation to see if there's something to be learned by that. Um, the idea is really to study the constraints that of space-time on quantum theory and do this in, in, in simple scenarios. You could think of going to more complex scenarios with, say, networks of events, perhaps, and SO3 or the Lorentz group and, you know, um, basically spin networks and things like this. But I think even the simplest scenarios are, are quite interesting already. Um, yeah, I've shown you that relativity of simultaneity constrains the dimensionality of the qubit in some setup. Um, that rotational symmetry, in some sense, um, determines the set of quantum correlations and the security of semi device independent randomness generation protocols. Maybe one way also to see the goal of this, of all this is to say um, it would be nice to have some kind of theory agnostic analysis of experiments in space and time. An experiment is always happening in space and time. You typically, you know, you don't input abstract zeros or ones, but you send pulses of some duration, you rotate something somewhere, you wait a certain time. Um, now, Doing an analysis of this without assuming the full machinery of quantum theory would be nice, I think. Finally, I want to throw out some kind of speculation. Um, namely, is this perhaps weak um, evidence that quantum theory might be modified in other regimes of space and time? Now, if you go back to the camels, yeah, then, then you can kind of see why you would that co conclude that there. Yeah, you, you find, okay, I've only seen camels with two humps in my life, but I can kind of understand that if two humps as a consequence of heat uh, and the desert, so maybe in other regimes where I haven't traveled before, they wouldn't have two humps. Um, similarly, you might say, well, if that can be really substantiated, that some of these aspects of quantum theory can be derived from synergies of space and time, without assuming quantum theory to begin with, then maybe in those regimes where our usual description doesn't apply, um, quantum theory could also perhaps be different. Is it evidence for that? Maybe, yes or no, I don't know. Um, perhaps not compelling, but it's at least hinting at that, maybe. Okay, so um, yes, so the two papers, the one, the old one and the one on randomness are on the archive on these numbers here. And yeah, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Marcos. Please join to, for thanking Marcos. And um, if there are any questions, uh, you can raise your hand via the, via the Zoom interface. Um, and then you can unmute yourself and ask. So 
so the moment so i'll start by asking a question so you mentioned that um so at first i was i was astonished by the result that um that the quantum the quantum set of correlations for the two rotations is the same for as this uh maximal generalization of it but uh, this is for the choice of two precisely two angles right zero or alpha have you looked at all in more angles or even like fuzzy angles like with uncertainty or something like this yes <laughs> uh i don't want to give out too much this top secret okay <laughs> well <laughs> no we'll, we'll wait if, for it then I guess. Eight, eight or more settings then we know there's a gap at some right. point for some j but okay. yeah although also it's only in the simplest scenario where you don't combine it with further post-processing and so on so yeah but, but there's a gap all right. all right thanks so marius raised his hand Um, hi, can you hi. hear me? Yep. Uh, so I, maybe to get the you know discussion going, let me admit my complete ignorance. Marcus, I didn't understand how you show these things. This it seems really very interesting though. Um, so maybe could you summarize um, what's the technique for saying that uh, having the relativity of simultaneity constrains the dimensionality of the qubit? I mean, I remember this slide, but I didn't really understand the argument. Yes, so I can sketch it a bit, at least the idea. Um, go back. Whoop, whoop, whoop. All right. Um, not worth it. So something like this. Um, right. Um, so there's certainly a, a formalist formalism within general probabilistic theories or Jordan algebras where you know how to deal with qubits here and this d-dimensional balls it's very simple essentially irreversible transformations are just rotations of of the ball yeah um and yeah the probability rule is essentially the same so measurements are described by, by vectors and preparations by another and then you take the overlap like for block vectors. So this is pretty well understood. And now here you would say, good, what am I looking for here from this scenario? Basically, I have I have this group SOD, yeah, so or um, SOD minus one. So yeah, the transformations of the ball that preserve one axis that I can just write down explicitly. And now I know that whatever Alice can do corresponds to a subgroup GA. Whatever Bob can do is another subgroup GB. And they should commute with each other, All right? So then the question boils down to finding commuting subgroups of SOD minus one for the various Ds. And they should also have the property that they are somehow large enough. They are somehow large enough to like exhaust most of the ball and to allow you to satisfy these, these assumptions here. Right. And for for the three ball, it would just be the rotations are around the set axis, all of them. Yeah. This is a commutative group. That's just SO2. And you give the same group to Alice and Bob. And it also satisfies these assumptions. And we can also find something like that in a special case in a five ball. But in higher balls, you cannot find it. You can kind of show a theorem that they, these groups, just these subgroups don't exist. They cannot be that large to like satisfy these these possibilities here, uh, these assumptions. Okay. Okay. Does, does somehow sketch it or? Yes, I need to think about more. Um, it, it's very interesting. It sounds very interesting. But uh, yeah. so, what's the let me put this way, uh, in a journal, journalistic way? So, what's the catch? If if you were to criticize this yourself. What is so it? Do you want me to criticize myself now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, um, well, <laughs> we would say we, we know already that the qubit has three dimensions. Uh, this has nothing to say about quantum gravity whatsoever. It's a like, like nice play with, <laughs> um, with formalism, and that's it. But I think that's maybe the case. But I think it's still interesting in the sense that it tells you something about the logical structure of the world. And if you think of this, the world, the, the physical universe as a kind of car, right? and then, you know, 
somehow if you hit with a hammer on part of it and you then suddenly the other part doesn't work anymore right so you somehow want to understand how things play together in the yes. logic architecture of our world in particular how to probabilities and space and time play together because that's in the end something that quantum gravity wants to do so, you know, on a more fundamental level right and this is what's done here yeah it, you understand better how these play together and which aspects um, you can explain from other aspects that you know about the world. Sure. I mean, the, the general philosophy, I actually like it a lot because somehow the way we say the story is that there is quantum mechanics, which is one thing, and there's going to do another thing. And let's try to put them together. But you're saying that, uh, you know, maybe there's a deeper interplay between uh, these two things. Yeah. yeah, you might also maybe think, well, maybe quantum theory is only... It's not the only theory out there, and one day we stumble across some other kind of correlations or probabilities described by some other theory. It's not completely unlikely. I would personally give it perhaps a chance of 10% or so. <laughs> I don't know. And then you need to know where to look for that. Where do you look for it? You cannot really see if popesco Rolich boxes lie around in your garden, right? You have to somehow say how conceivable beyond quantum behavior would fit into space and time. And that's also, I think, contributing to that. That in the end, you want to do an experiment. Like here's a new experiment, where the null result is not from the onset already clear, but we could actually hope to find to, to test quantum theory in an interesting context. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Um, related to this point, uh, to the question of Marius, um, Jonathan Oppenheim asks in the chat, why do the operations have to commute with each other? I don't know. The T A and T B. Yeah, I don't know if he wants to say more. Right. Um, so here, um, as I said, so you know, the order of the operations, how you would describe this as the order of operations, depends on your frame of reference, right? Um, so. What will not depend on your frame of reference is probability of having a click or not a click at the very end where the two arms get together again for a fixed for any fixed measurement over all measurements that you can do. Um, and this means in whatever state you send in in the beginning and whatever measurement you do at the end, the order of TA and TB doesn't matter. And so as you get then that they must as transformations commute. It's, it's certainly obviously follows directly when you when you formulate this in kinds of tensor product you think if you have two modes and then you have an entangled state of two modes or so and then the, you know the transformations just act on different modes assuming quantum theory if you want i'm sure if that answers your question or if there's some other subtlety that you want to point out here Jonathan. no i just i think i just missed that argument when you came back but now that i hear it that makes okay. sense In fact, there's, a, there's another question by David Mayer about this specific result. Uh, he's asking why um, why not simply conclude that the rotations only act on a two-dimensional subspace? Uh, David, if um, you want to unmute yourself to ask more. Now that's it. That's the question. Okay, why? So, so certainly, um, this is something that happens in quantum theory, you know, this, so you have a two dimensional subspace, which is just spanned by the two one particle states of the modes being either in the left, or like in the upper and the lower branch. And certainly you can think of this as a two dimensional Hilbert subspace of an infinite dimensional Fox space, uh, or whatever you have here that, that will describe your setup. Um, the, the claim, however, is that you, so, so, so the goal here is a bit different. So you say, I want to start from a formalism where I don't even know what it even means to have a Hilbert space. I don't even know what it means to have a subspace. I just want to ask, how about this specific phenomenology here? Right? Really only this experiment where I know I have one particle and I know I have it either in the upper or in the lower branch. What could this effective uh, system which is perhaps a subsystem of something larger, what could that look like in principle if you don't assume quantum theory? The answer is it could look like these possibilities that I've written down. Um, it may be a subspace of something much larger, 
or it may even be the case that it's not a subspace in the usual sense, but perhaps, you know, it's a three ball that you see in your data, but actually it's a seven ball. It's just that the other four dimensions never take part in the experiment. That's for sure also possible. Yeah, so that's, so the answer is we don't know. Yes, but we cannot, no, this is for every experiment, no? You can always say, here's the correlations I see in my experiment. Um, I get this, see, you know, this is the largest value I've seen for my correlation. Maybe experiments that I do tomorrow on the system gives me still larger value or tell me that I've overlooked some degrees of freedom. Yeah. So then I have a related question, which is, uh, would this argument change at all if space-time were d plus one dimensional, but for d not equal to three? No, so this argument doesn't depend at all on the dimensionality of space-time. So this D here is really uh, the abstract dimension of the Bloch ball. Um, it's the, the number of parameters in your probabilistic state space, which turns out to be three for a qubit. Could be different. So this is not directly related to the space spatial dimension. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to use the same letter. Capital D plus one, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So you're no, saying this, this argument is independent of space-time dimension. It that's just right. Has it just has to accept, I guess, if we were in zero plus one dimensions, we couldn't do a rotation. Yes, I guess. Um, well, you would want to have, you need enough space to set up two space-like separated arms. So let me think. Well, actually, even one plus one, you couldn't do a rotation. Probably, yes. <laughs> yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah the, the space, the diagram in the, in the uh, is two plus one. No, sorry. Um, so we have Sotiris. Next. Hi. Uh, Hi. I found I it fascinating that you constrain the dimensionality based on relativity of simultaneity. Uh, the first time that I, I, I heard that. And uh, I wanted to ask about the commutation relations, but I think we covered it. And uh, it's a good explanation. But I also want to ask what singles out the associativity? Because there is this, the the so-called threefold way that goes back to Dyson, which does the same thing, but they never mention the argument does not go to the relativity of simultaneity. And I've been learning about the threefold way, and now I, I saw you talking about the relativity of simultaneity and how that singles out associativity. I, I was wondering if there's an intuition there that you can offer. Um, yes, it's interesting. So it's... Um... I mean, it's it's not so much the case that I set out here a task of studying associativity, like having it or not. It more just turns out that once you write down these postulates, it just gives you dimensions one, two, three, and five. It doesn't allow, for example, dimension nine, which would be a qubit over the octonions, which would also be a perfectly valid state space of formally real Jordan algebra. It could perhaps be a, an interesting um project to just see what about this d equal to nine case specifically could it maybe it doesn't exactly satisfy the desiderata that i've written down here but maybe something interesting could also happen on an interferometer for that case and something analogous of these two alice and bob subgroups could still be found there um perhaps in a more complicated way um i should also say this is really just the, the bit right and it's not that not like the higher level complex or quaternionic state spaces, not, not like those would come out of it. That's just not the case. Uh, do, do you have this, this theory improved in one of your papers? Uh, I would be very interested to see how this, this follows. Um, so this specific theorem, yes. So that's on my last slide. I had this archive number 14, 2014. It's already a bit older published in 2017. Uh, when you go to the email uh, with the announcement, there's also the link to it. And, and there will you'll find the proof. Yeah. Okay, it's thank not you. That thank you. Bit of group theory, yeah. That is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a second. Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a very interesting um, uh, relation. Um, um, I, I, I'm trying to grasp the idea of the device independent, not the semi-device independent. So uh, I'm not sure I got the idea. So how do you encode exactly? Which constraints you encode into your probabilities or how do they come about exactly uh, device independent? I wanted to ask a bit. Uh, yeah. 
Mm. So, so, right, I hear myself, but okay, <laughs> try to do it the best. So yes, so again, the intuition here that that you would see on on this um, picture here is, for example, that you say, um, I don't know what my preparation device and my measurement devices are doing, but I'm sending qubits now. And not, one thing I know about qubits is that I cannot encode two bits in a single qubit perfectly. That just doesn't work. Right. So when you think of the X, which can be one, two, three, or four on the left, as the input to the preparation device, then the state comes out, cannot perfectly remember what that was. Right. So no matter which measurement you do, you cannot perfectly recover your choice of X. And there must be some element of randomness um, sitting inside there when you when you see the outcome. Um, depending on what certainly um, it's not automatically always random. It could just be that the measurement device just always gives you plus one, full stop, yeah? <laughs> right? So what you still need to do is you need to look at this probability that you see, the, the correlation that you actually see in your data, and it should have an interesting form, uh, interesting enough to conclude that you actually assessed some of this randomness in your measurement, even if you don't know what that measurement is. Mm -hmm. But the, the main idea, so... so at least you have to exclude that the, in, the information about the preparation gets perfectly encoded in your system. And for us, it means, for example, if the spin here, let me get here, if the spin is small, yeah, and you do only a, a small rotation, then this is never enough to orthogonalize the state. Mm -hmm. So you wiggle only a little bit, a small angle, and then you would need a very large spin to actually see an orthogonal state coming from it. It's a bit like a speed limit in quantum theory yeah, for mm -hmm. time translations. When you evolve just for a very short amount of time, you, you typically do not orthogonalize unless the energy is very high. Mm -hmm. And this is like the spin analog of that thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, but, but do you have some specific decomposition of the probabilities or...? Or is there some specific way that one can see how the probabilities decompose under these constraints? So, <clears throat> uh, I mean, this is the usual way that I think of the device independent, like Bell or like others, you always encode uh, some sort of constraints into your decomposition of probabilities. So this is why I'm, I'm a little bit having a hard time to understand what is device independent, because you also have some dimension. So we are transferring a two bit, this Rx in the initial um, slide was dimension two, right? So so this okay. is I'm struggling to understand what is device independent uh, here. Yeah. So here it's semi. People call it semi device independent, ah, okay. you know, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So because this assumption that whatever travels here has been less than J, I mean, why believe that, right? Um, it's not something that 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 you can be sure for other reasons. Like, mm -hmm. so, so in a bell in a bell experiment, the an analog of the spin condition here would just be the no signaling condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? I just believe that there is no signaling from A to B. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. believe that because maybe you put big walls between A and B, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the catch is there's also another physical theory, relativity, which tells you if you bring that far away from each other, uh, very far away, then that mm -hmm. other theory, relativity, guarantees you that there cannot be signaling. And voila, great. Well, in that sense, it's fully device independent, and you don't need to put any non non theoretic like by theories. Mm -hmm. um, any beliefs basically on on the working of your device, but the analog of assuming no signaling would here the assumption that you put on the transmitted system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Richard East. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I just had a, a question more about the technique you use. So going back to the slide, everyone seems to be interested in with the commutation relation. Um, yeah. So to, to state in advance my sort of background on this, I can, I'm quite interested in spin networks, particularly directly in relation to quantum information. And then the quantum gravity stuff is a bit next to the things I look at um, most of the time. But looking at this, I basically I want to see, uh, suggest something. And if it's nonsense, then I, I can like, cross this off as a direction to, to stare at or not. But a big problem in spin networks or something I could run into is I, sometimes I want to identify two different spin networks that are somehow the same. Um, because these things you have to sum over them and it's a nightmare and uh, it's cheers for everybody. 
And one thing I'm seeing here is, okay, I'm imagining, say I have my spin network and then each little vertex in the network, this is supposed to be a blob of space time. So it's a, a place where something can exist. Now using this formally in, in the spin network formalism, there isn't really a way to say that without doing extra things. But being very loose about things, I might say, okay, well, my vertex, this is a place a thing can be, a place a thing can happen. And I look at this sort of interferometer argument here and I say, okay, well, does this give me two different, if I was to take my spin network and imagine two different routes of an inter interferometer, two different paths a particle could take and two different things that could happen along it, would this be a way to sort of operationally identify different spin networks from a quantum information perspective? This isn't something you can really say just looking at sort of a spin network quantum info, quantum gravity um, position, but taking this sort of, this perspective of yours really allows you to say, okay, I don't really know what's going on, but I can put it in this box and I can imply things because of the way the, way the correlations are going to work. And I'm just sort of thinking, okay, is this, is this a credible formal direction to, to ask questions about identifying different spin networks? I mean, as I say it, I'm starting to think maybe it would just be actually just saying that these things are topologically deformable. But uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, this this is just something I wanted to put out there and hear your thoughts. Uh, if you, you yeah. have any idea in particular, it sounds very interesting. I think it would give throw two two questions back. <laughs> One of them would be: Is there a notion of somehow say intervention on on these spin networks? Because here you can think of Alice decides to do one thing and not the other. <laughs> um, that's that's often what people do here and. Um, I mean, the second question would be somehow relativity of simultaneity is certainly some a special case of Lorentz invariance in some sense. So the way I understand spin networks, it's isn't this already built into the formalism? So the particular um, version I'm thinking of would be like the limit to the SU2 version, actually. So this would not okay. have um, mm -hmm. SL2C built in. This would be just looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from my perspective, I see these things as like a mix of like like quantum information, Hilbert spaces that mm -hmm. happen to have this relation to, to quantum gravity stuff we've seen in the right light. But yeah, but implicitly, I don't necessarily have that if I'm just looking at an SU2 spin network. Uh -huh. um, well, I mean, okay, go to spin foams if you wanted this to have a proper SL2C stuff. But it, it's still not clear to me that this isn't a, a good way to say, okay, maybe I don't really know what's going on, but perhaps I can use that phrase again, like box things up and see if I can identify different correlations. Um, and I, I take your point about the intervention on a spin network. And I, yeah, it, there's no obvious way to say, okay, I'm, you know, there's two different ways somebody acted within it because the spin network formalism doesn't have a way to even express that, right? No, uh, it's not no. a thing but one can say, no. uh, at least as far as I, I use it. But it's still this idea that, okay, there's two different identifications of things that could have been said to have happened. Mm -hmm. This this seems like a credible way to say, okay, well, this thing is kind of like this thing because if I took an operational perspective and I allowed myself to say things can happen in these chunks of space-time, these two would be identified. Mm -hmm. This feels like a thing that you could maybe say without having to add too much to the spin network formalism or without having to interfere with the spin network itself, which is something technically I just don't know how you'd go about saying. Right. Okay. It sounds very interesting to me. Maybe sh shall we discuss at some other point actually about this? Um, I sure, mean, honestly, sure. because it's, I would like to follow up on this if you. Yeah, no, okay. That would be great. Um, so thanks. perhaps you can email and then. See if we chat about this. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. If, if I look a bit at spin networks too, I find this very interesting. So, it would be cool to chat. Uh, I guess. Great. Yeah, that would be fun. Thank you. Uh, thanks again. Then we have Amin. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I just have a small question. So, if I understand well, you're working in a non-relativistic quantum mechanics, but you are still using this condition that is similar to the commutativity condition when you have operators in quantum field theory when they are separated by space-like separation. And um, I just want to, to see if, for example, the operators TA and TB are, uh, I don't know, like labeled by space-type points because, in, for example, in quantum field theory, you have this field of operators and this commutativity conditions in kind of causality condition that we imposed by hand. And it seems that even you, if you are working in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you are still using this condition. And uh, yeah, I just want to, because then you should yeah. also modify, for example, other, um, like, I don't know, like the Schrodinger equation will not, uh, 
is not relativistic. So for me, the commutativity relation is really a relativistic uh, condition. So are you working in a relativistic quantum mechanics framework or, uh, yeah, just want to clarify on on this, this commutativity condition, like what's the meaning of it? Yeah, so I mean, it, this the Hilbert space framework, or you know, the, that the quantum states correspond to density matrices of the Hilbert space, and so that doesn't matter if it's relativistic or non-relativistic. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say that I work in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I just work with quantum theory, right? And this commutation here is indeed different a bit from the way we used to it from quantum field theory. Um, in quantum field theory, you would assign, you say there's a space-time region A and another one B. And then I have, um, in some sense, you would at least intuitively think of operators as living in one region, not the other, right? And then you write down micro locality as a commutation relation, for example. But here, indeed, um, even when you think of the qubit here now, the, the, the qubit um, in standard complex quantum theory of this interferometer that's already delocalized. It describes it's spanned by two basis elements, like one particle up and zero down, or zero particles up and one down. So it's a two-dimensional subspace of Fox space, basically. And this commutation in this case is realized by the fact that it's just a complex phase and it, it's, it lives on the same qubit. So, so basically TA, TB could be the same. So Alice and so Bob could do exactly the same identical transformation as Alice, describe the exact same operator in this framework. Right? Just the, the one operator operation that rotates this one block ball by some angle around the z-axis. Right? So it's not in this sense sitting on like located or, or supported on, on a, on a space-time subregion. It's yeah. just as a subgroup of operations that correspond to those of Alice and another subgroup corresponding to those of Bob. Okay, but then when you give this example of simultaneity and observers observing things, it seems that they really observe that uh, operators are uh, attached to a space-time region and there is an operation going on in this particular region, right? That, that's how you justify the, the commutation relation. Because at no. least something, I mean, the operation is, is happening in space-time and the, the, the way to justify the commutation relation is that to observe in space time will observe, uh, they should observe the same thing. Um, I mean, then there's this relativistic argument, but I feel that the, the operator should have a label in space time, uh, like in quantum field theory to uh, apply relativistic arguments on them, right? I don't see a only... reason to, um, to import formalism from relativity or elsewhere if I don't need it. Right? And, and here you don't need it. It's really, the case, the motivation for commutation does not come from any assumption of micro locality or any formal consideration and how you would phrase it in terms of the operator algebra. It's just operationally, yeah, you think of Alice and Bob and whatever they do, the order shouldn't matter. Right? So as soon, since before, one step before, uh, you've set up a scheme where a block ball describes where the particle is, then the operations that Alice and Bob do must correspond to some operations on this block ball, right? And then it's really just operationally motivated that they must commute, right? But asking what can they do if I assume this specific principle of relativity? So, so if I that's, that's how it's in quantum optics, you can phrase it in that way. You know, you really have just just a phase plate that you do locally, and it's a if you do it in the other arm, it's just exactly the same transformation, maybe with a minus sign on on the phase. Okay. So they will still have to commute even if they are inside the same light cone. They don't have to, I mean, there is no this space-like uh, separation. I mean, even if they are in the same light cone, you still have this commutation. The, the, the space-like separation is set up in the description of the scenario, right? In the way how I described the scenario operationally to begin with. It's not built into the, the formalism to begin with. Right? It's, yeah. It's not that I say, oh, you know, I, I use now uh, operator algebra and, and here's a subalgebra, there's another subalgebra, and I try to yeah. model that. No, right? Yeah. Um, you don't want to do this, especially because we want, don't want to assume quantum theory. And then you kind of need to get rid of as much of the formalism as, as you can to say something interesting. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, actually, I have a question um, regarding the, the actually not the beginning of your talk, but the end of your talk, um, because you mentioned this uh, fascinating possibility that uh, were somehow space time be different or were we in a different reg regime of whatever described space times, perhaps we would have a, a different physics than quantum physics. And I'm, I'm very curious about this. I don't I was also, I, I didn't understand the first time around that this uh, requirement that in the first uh, paper you were saying that D needs to be less than equal than three doesn't have anything to do with space time somehow. But do you, uh, but I know that you have actually proved many results in this specific direction of relating space time to quantum mechanics. So I wanted to ask you if there are other papers of yours or anybody else's where actually you end up determining something about both quantum mechanics and special relativity or, and, and space time. Um, yes and no. So I think one should be careful um, to, to read too much into it. I think in principle, so, so um, there's certainly a tempting uh, research program to say, I want to derive space time structure from the structure of quantum theory, somehow like the opposite direction of, of this here. But there you can easily you know, say that it, it cannot be that easy because you can just imagine quantum theory living in whatever d plus one dimensions and whatever exotic backgrounds that are not not even GR and so on. And, you know, even um, even Robert Erkel's work on quantum field theory where he says that like, you can make a space-time formalism for a theory that's probabilistic that need not be quantum theory and so on. So there's a lot of room there for how things could be different. So... This, the, the other than yes, some 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 other papers that we've written where we, for example, try to connect um, the dimensionality of the Bloch sphere, Bloch ball, which is three, with that of space, which is also three, which I still find compelling, and uh, I, I feel it's more than a coincidence. Um, I would perhaps even point here. I've written papers on that, but let me point instead to paper by Chaslav Brookman and Bodyway Dukic instead, which I think is perhaps more interesting than the one I've written back then, um, where they say, write down a consistency condition. So, so I, somehow you, you can think of building a big magnet from little small magnets, and the magnets could be your, your qubits, and maybe your qubits are d-dimensional. And then in d-dimensional space, you would build a d-dimensional magnet where you deflect particles. And the way that these little magnets can play together and compose into something larger is so constrained that it can basically only have d equal to three and so so there are some okay. some some arguments to be made that i find extremely interesting um i one has to be careful as i said so that, i mean to make easily one can be tempted to make too strong assumptions there's also this this old story of of weizsäcker's ur theory um, where people try to derive too much i think from too little assumptions um, but I think that, 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 you know, maybe the trick is to prove theorems, right? Say, mm -hmm. yep. there are a bunch of assumptions. Um, if I assume that, what are the possibilities? Let's enumerate the possibilities. And let's put out the assumptions motivated by phenomena that I can perhaps see in experiments. And um, I find it somehow um, most fruitful at the moment to, to link up with the semi-device invented protocols stuff um, or you know, cryptography in the end, because people there are used to think very careful about the assumptions they make, because they want to be damn sure that nobody can <laughs> predict their random numbers and read their keys, right? So you're forced to think very carefully. That's why I've moved more in that direction of trying to relate it to this kind of research direction. Right. And thank you. Thanks. Um, if there are no other questions, um, then let's thank again Marcus for his time and for his. Oh, is there? Oh, no, no, Western uh, oh. is thanking you live. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you very much. I will stop the recording. Thanks.